Welcome to the Sound Health Network's webinar series. I'm Indre Viscontis, your host and moderator for today's event. The Sound Health Network is led by co-directors Julene Johnson and Charles Lim, who also composed our introductory music, and music therapist Sherry Robb and I round out the leadership team. Our mission is to promote research and public awareness about the impact of music on health and wellness. The Sound Health Network is a partnership of the National Endowment for the Arts with the University of California, San Francisco, in collaboration with the National Institutes of Health, the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, and Renee Fleming. This webinar series features interdisciplinary conversations between researchers and other stakeholders in our community, representing diverse perspectives and addressing obstacles that stand in the way of our mission. This month, we're gonna talk about babies and the people who love them. Lullabies have been part of human culture for as long as we've had a written record. Why does it feel so instinctive to sing to our little ones? What might be the benefit to either the babies themselves or their caregivers? We'll be joined by three expert panelists to learn more. Dr. Laurel Trainer is a cognitive psychologist studying how music affects us at McMaster University in Canada. Formerly trained as a musician and still active as a principal flute of Symphony Hamilton, her research interests include the perception and cognition of music, human auditory perceptual and cognitive development, and how music can enhance emotional development and social interaction even in infancy. She is also the founding and current director of Live Lab at McMaster University, a one of a kind 100 seat concert hall equipped with virtual acoustics, the ability to measure EEG and physiology in both audience members and performers, motion capture, sound recording, and video presentation. The lab promises to provide valuable information on how performers and audiences interact how children learn music and how music can be used to promote health. Dr. Deanna Hansen Abermite is a board certified music therapist and a faculty member at the University of Kansas. She has worked in the hospital setting with premature infants, pediatrics, adults, and psychiatry. Dr. Hansen Abermite is the editor of two monographs on music therapy in the hospital setting. Her area of clinical and research focus is on preventive music-based interventions with infants who are neurodevelopmentally at risk, particularly infants who are premature or living in poverty. She was also on the faculty at the University of Missouri, Kansas City Conservatory of Music and Dance, where she received the Mural McBride Kaufman Excellence in Teaching Award. And Dr. Helen Schumark, who has more than 30 years experience as a clinical music therapist and is on faculty at Temple University in the Boyer College of Music and Dance. Moving from special education and early intervention into pediatrics, she established the first program in neonatology in Australia at the Royal Children's Hospital, Melbourne. As a team leader for sensory experience in early development at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, her research focuses on auditory experience and specifically maternal voice to support infant development in hospital. She's a founding member of the Applied Music and Neuroscience and Pediatrics Group, drawing together researchers and clinicians in acute pediatrics. She's also the founder of the Music and the Neurodevelopmentally At-Risk Infant Group, which is an international group of neuroscientists, music therapists, medical professionals, public health experts, and parents collaborating to build effective music programs for neurologically at-risk infants. Laurel, Deanna, Helen, welcome to the Sound Health Network's webinar series. So I'd love to start, Laurel, with you. If you could give us an overview of some of your research on what might be the purpose of early music interventions with infants? Why is it that it seems that no matter who you are, when you see a baby, you wanna pick them up and dance? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me and, and for organizing these, these great uh, conversations. And I'm looking forward to the one today. Um, yeah, so it's interesting that not only is music universal across human cultures, but singing to babies seems to be universal across human cultures. 
And so when I started many decades ago, looking into, you know, why this might be, uh, you know, we've gone on a, a bit of a journey and, and done uh, sort of lots of measurements on different aspects of, of infants' perception and so on. Um, but the thing that's always stood out to me is the social context in which, you know, parents and caregivers sing to the baby. So I always keep coming back to that. And one of the interesting things about music is we tend to think of it as auditory, but actually it really intimately involves movement. We have to move to play instruments or to sing. And when we listen to music, we wanna to move to the music. And when you look at the way caregivers interact with their babies, they don't just sing to them, but they also move with them. So they're rocking them or they're bouncing them. And in fact, before the infants are even born, they're getting concurrent uh, experience with both moving and auditory sounds associated with that. So there's this intimate connection there between moving and music and how we interact with infants. So, you know, what purpose is this, is this serving? Well, probably a lot of different purposes. We know that it helps them, um, you know, develop speech perception and, you know, cognitive, <clears throat> excuse me, cognitive development. But in the social realm, uh, we started to look at studies that have been done in adults that showed that when adults move together in synchrony, which music is a great way to move with others in synchrony, but after a few uh, minutes of, of experiencing moving together with another adult in synchrony, people rate that they like the adult better, that they trust them more. And if you actually give them a game to play in which they can either cooperate or compete, they'll cooperate more. So there's something about moving with others in synchrony, at least in the adult period, uh, that has these powerful social implications. And so we thought we'd look in infants and see is this already present in infants. And indeed we found that it is. So Infants aren't yet able to completely accurately synchronize their movements uh, to music. They don't have yet the motor control. So we bounce the infants, you know, similarly to how they might experience it in the real world to music. And while they were watching an experimenter that they had not met before, who bounced either in synchrony with them to the music or bounced at a different tempo. So bounced out of synchrony with them. Um, these infants were at the time 14 month olds. So they were able to pick up objects and do, you know, overt behaviors like that. So after just three minutes of experiencing either bouncing in sync or bouncing out of sync, we gave the infants the opportunity to help the experimenter. So the experimenter would accidentally drop an object that she needed to complete a task, like, you know, pinning clothespins on a line, she'd accidentally drop the clothespin. And then we gave the infant 30 seconds to either pick it up and hand it back to her to help her or not. And what we found was infants were actually about twice as likely to help if they had experienced synchronous movement with her compared to asynchronous movement. So this is telling us that even early in life, these experiences that infants are having with the people around them that are either synchronous or asynchronous are actually affecting who they decide to befriend and help. And we think this might even be the you know one early manifestation of, of the origins of, of empathy. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the, your other studies that is a, I'm a big fan of um, was one in which you looked at uh, babies as early as six months uh, and they were either in a participatory group music making environment or not. Um, and then you look to see what six months later, their ability to recognize gestures and, and, and gestural communication was like. So tell us about that study. Yeah, so we, in the study, we randomly assigned, you know, parent and infants to either come into sort of a music, early music and, and parent class where they learned uh, to sing songs together. The parents would even help them play the xylophones together. Uh, so a lot of interaction between the, the infants and the, and the caregiver in the musical situation. And the other half were came to a class in which they still experienced music, but it was played in the background where they could play at different you know, stations, the ball station and the book station. So, so both were interactive sorts of environments, but the one had the synchronous movement to the music and the attention to the music. And what we found after six months of this experience was, even though there were no differences between the infants beforehand, 
By 12 months of age, the infants who experienced uh, the music together classes uh, were more advanced in terms of their early language skills. So these early communicative gesturing um, that's predictive of later language outcome. Uh, their parents also reported and question standardized questionnaires that their infants were happier, that they were less upset by novel situations and, and things like that. So both socially and cognitively, those infants seem to be on um, a faster trajectory. Um, of course, we don't know if the other infants would catch up afterwards, but it suggests that those early experiences are, are really having a significant effect on infants' development. And that also underscores um, the way that music can have effects that maybe aren't as obvious. You know, in the music training and, and brain development literature, we, we sort of talk about the difference between near and far transfer. So, you know, does the, do the skills that you gain in the musical training environment, um, do they transfer to situations in which, you know, it, it's really quite far from the kinds of skills that you're developing. So an example of near transfer for listeners who might not know um, is sort of like some kind of auditory discrimination task or fine motor task. If you're learning to play the piano, that seems to make sense that if you're working on those skills in, in you know, the music class that you could, you could show some transfer of, of environments in which those skills are useful. But the idea of far transfer where, you know, you learn something in a music class, but somehow it affects things like your vocabulary or um, some other kind of spatial reasoning where the link between the study and the, you know, performative environment is not as clear. This is a great example of this kind of far transfer in these social communicative gesturing um, and, and that advance, advancement. And, you know, in some ways it's not quite transfer, but there's all these other unexpected effects that I wanted uh, to ask Deanna to tell us about um, in the neonatal ICU. And so, so these in infants that are either premature or otherwise, you know, in trouble um, at birth that where they need to stay in the hospital longer. So tell us a little bit about your work um, in the NICU and sort of what those findings are. Great, sure. So it, I'm really excited to be here because so much of Dr. Trainer's work has influenced the things that um, not only myself, but other music therapists working with infants um, are using as the basic foundation. And so um, I think some of the things that I've learned in my work in the, the neonatal intensive care unit is that there are such a variety of needs for premature infants. So every time we walk into that environment, um, I'm always after you know 20 plus years still surprised by hmm this is kind of a new um, need that is presenting itself but some of the core work that we do and some of the things that I've focused not only my clinical work on but also some of the research that I'm doing is this idea of synchrony so um, the most of the literature that's looking at brain development and social interactions with infants is being done with infants who are a little bit older and can demonstrate some of the behaviors that we might be looking for and measuring. But with premature infants, they're really sensitive and that they're at this neurodevelopment, um, just neurodevelopment. They're all their, their, some of their sensory systems are coming on board and um, the neural tracts are still developing. And so that environmental or afferent sensory experiences are really important to their development. So this idea of synchrony is actually really important because when we think about sensory system organization, our sensory systems develop very sequentially. So um, tactile vestibular, um, gustatory and olfactory, auditory and visual. And what we know from animal and human studies is um, overstimulation to those later developing sensory systems can actually imp negatively impact those earlier developing sensory systems. And so they're all very reciprocal and important. So when we look at providing music interventions in the, the neonatal intensive care unit, one of the things that I'm really looking at is helping that sensory system organization. Um, and so that idea of synchrony is really, really important so that I'm not overstimulating as a music therapist or another professional caregiver or a family caregiver. We're not overstimulating their ability to handle that information that's coming in from the environment but actually can organize it. And then we can gradually increase the complexity of it as we're presenting 
rocking synchronized with the tempo of our singing and the complexity of um, how we're using our voice, for example. So it's really fascinating how when we understand what's happening in the little bit older infants, we can translate that into these um, you know, developing neurological systems and really fragile little, little people that need careful integration of this information. You know, one of the, um, the one of the findings that I that I've read about in in terms of music interventions in the NICU is that they have sort of very measurable impacts on, um, you know, th thriving or or uh, you know I don't know quite what the what the term is to say, but you know, for example, um, it, it premature babies putting on weight more quickly. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of these kinds of measures or or things that you've observed? <laughs> I think that we have some measures that are out there that we're, we're borrowing from other places. So like what nursing caring about in the medical environment and things like weight gain is really important for a baby because that that is one way to measure their level of exertion. So babies that are overstressed will tend to lose weight, which can have a direct relationship to not only their brain development, but their physical development and their ability to, to um, to eat. So that ability to um, suck, swallow, and breathe simultaneously. So one of those later hurdles that babies will, will accomplish before they're actually able to go home from the nursery. I think in terms of music interventions and looking at outcomes, we're not quite getting it with in terms of measures. And that's really something that um, I'm really working on and others um, that we're, we're really trying to find those measures that are actually sensitive enough that are telling us how and why the music is actually contributing to some of the outcomes that we're looking at, behavioral changes. Um, so changes in the stress response or self-regulatory behaviors, these things that we see, but also then what's the role of the music? How and why are the, the elements of the music that we're using making those changes? So while weight gain can be an outcome that we look at, um, what we're still seeing are, are more short-term outcomes as well. So especially when we're really looking at these premature infants, things that are happening and changing during the music intervention sessions, but we don't quite understand, at least in my opinion, um, in a satisfactory way, how is that impacting later development? So what's happening with those babies that are born prematurely that go into those music experiences and that social context and how are they then demonstrating those outcomes that, that um, Dr. Trainer has been seeing in her work? Great. Well, I definitely want to get back to this, this issue of measures and, and how do we, you know, characterize the effect of music. Um, but Helen, let's talk a little bit about the caregivers. Um, after all, they are also part of the equation. And, you know, if you look at some of the... Uh, um, content of lullabies, sometimes I think they're more for the people doing the rocking than the ones being rocked <laughs> um, when they describe, you know, elements of uh, punishment or rage or many of the things that uh, first time parents can feel in those early days. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that I just want to start in by saying I, I noticed that when Deanna was talking about using voice in the NICU, that as she started to talk about it, her voice started to soften and her timbre started <laughs> to soften and she got a little slower, a little breathier. And <laughs> instinctively, you know, she's so skilled in working as a music therapist in the NICU that that really shows. Um, and I think that this is one of the important things that we need to understand that all of these instinctive behaviours that we attribute to parents, first-time parents, parents who've had many children before, when we get into that NICU environment, that instinctive kind of behaviour can be really muted and muffled by the context, as Laurel said, you know, the context in which we experience these things together. This is, this is a really demanding context that we find these families in. It's very difficult to separate out the infant from the family. You know, it's not an either or or put together. They are always part of each other, right? And so our ability to support them as a unit is really what's important. And the ability to understand how the family's musical life, the family's musical heritage can really serve as a source of nurturing, not only for the infant, but for the family as well, because they're, they are under such enormous pressure. This is not the experience they expected. This is not the, the birth that they expected. This 
baby may not be exactly in the shape that they expected. Nobody really expects their baby to be unwell. And if they do know that ahead of time, there's a lot of stress around this. So what impact that has on their capacity to generate synchrony, which seems to be our theme inadvertently. I mean, I'm all about synchrony as well. And Laurel's work has been pivotal in our understanding of what's lost in the NICU the opportunity to move in synchrony when you are a baby in an uh, incubator or a baby with uh, central lines and uh, all kinds of impediments, can't be lifted out of the bed at all, there is no opportunity for motor synchrony. And so what we see is that musical life can actually serve as this really important, pivotal way for, for parents and babies to remain in synchrony and experience each other in a positive way, for sure. Yeah, I mean, that really, it really resonates with me. I, you know, I had a child in the NICU and it was my firstborn and it was a, yeah, right. it was a very jarring experience. It was not at all what we expected. It was a total shock. Yeah. And yeah, I remember like just not being able to pick up my baby, right? Um, you know, and all these things and and that just being, you know, in, in, in many ways traumatic for both of us, you know. That's it. Um, That's it. So I want to let our, um, our viewers know, if you're watching us live on YouTube, uh, feel free to put questions into the chat or the comments section, um, and we will get to those uh, once we have the opportunity. But Helen, I'd just like to stick with uh, you for a moment and mm -hmm. learn a little bit more about how do you overcome some of the um, some of these constraints in the NICU environment. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, you know, often like sound is a big issue because yeah. the baby is not usually the only one in that room they don't get their own room so mm -hmm. you know how do you how do you navigate some of those challenges mm -hmm. um, and demonstrate that music um, provides more benefit than say mm -hmm. the cost of extraneous noise yeah, yeah. I think we're in an interesting situation, Indra, in fact, that because we have both those units that have the big rooms with many, many babies in them. And then we have, uh, of course, the more modern design where babies are in their own room in a, in a neonatal intensive care unit. It's just the, the baby, one baby in a pod and that's it. And both of those situations actually cause us to have extreme experiences, either really complex, noisy environments, which are not, you know, very inducive to good, good continuous sleep for the baby. And then the, the individual rooms where we're seeing research emerging that says it's not stimulating enough. I think amidst all of this, what we're really trying to do is to try and keep those things at bay and really provide the baby and the parents with meaningful sound. So the opportunity for the baby to have a, a range of stimulation, which is meaningful. So in the work that I do, for me, that means how do we bring to them a sounds which have some cultural familiarity, familial familiarity, that's a lot of familiars, isn't it? Um, but basically, you know, a, an experience of their family's music. We hope that these babies, even if they're, they're preterm, but a lot of the babies that I work with have medically, are medically complex, full-term infants, they've been listening. They've been listening to their family's music and they already have an experience of their, their family's music in that third trimester while they're in utero. So how do we introduce that in a way which is both safe and productive for them and gives their parents a really pivotal role in bringing their family into the unit for their baby to have an experience of them. Uh, so that is my focus, meaningful sound. And I think that the parents are the vehicle. If we can get them in the room and keep them in the room, they are definitely the primary vehicle for uh, creating that, uh, that sensory experience for the baby. Yeah, underscoring that importance of, um, you know, uh, of culture and, and of, of meaningful music, you know, mm. in our, in our uh, newsletter this month, we profiled a program that Carnegie Hall has developed called the Lullaby Project, mm -hmm. where they pair musicians with first time parents, especially first time parents who unexpectedly became parents. Um, and they have them uh, write a song together for mm -hmm. their unborn child as a way of like sort of helping them bond. Laurel, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about these challenges of the cultural specificity of music. Since so a lot of your work is about um, bonding and about sort of gestures that are part of social interactions, you know, what what do you how do you navigate the the issue of of um, people are very subjective in terms of their music tastes and 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 you know how they approach music. 
Yeah, that's a huge question and, and really so important. Um, and I have to say, from the, the sort of reach research side, we've really fallen down and most of our research is on Western music and sort of in Western cultures. Um, so I have to say, I really am in awe of the uh, music therapists who are the ones on the ground in there who are trying to navigate and do all this, um, this work and we don't have really the, the adequate research behind some of it yet. Um, but I, but I, I think it is clear there are a number of studies that suggest that the, the music of the culture and, and bringing the family in is one of the critical um, variables that's going to help the, the, the babies develop optimally. So I think that much is clear. So we have to do it, difficult as it might be. Um, I mean, from a theoretical point of view, uh, it's very interesting to see, you know, what is common across all cultures and, you know, singing to babies, moving with babies, these things are all common across cultures, but there are also differences. Uh, so, you know, for example, in the Western music, we tend to use fairly simple rhythms where a lot of other cultures, even in the music to infants can have, you know, quite complex rhythms. Um, and so understanding, uh, you know, how important that is, you know, for being for the infant to be part of that family and that culture and experience that from from an early age, uh, I think is really important. Um, you know, and one of the things that I, I might mention is I've, I've just uh, started a, a study with a, a wonderful group in France who study premature infants. Um, and so we've actually, we can take brain measures, EEG measures of their responses to rhythm, auditory rhythms. And to my surprise, premature infants are already showing neural oscillations that entrain to the rhythms that we present them. I didn't think that would happen. Like I was actually surprised, uh, but it's clearly there. And so um, again, I think it underlines just how important that, you know, the stimulus that we give them is because whatever it is, it's going to be affecting their, their brain development. Yeah, so Deanna, hearing, hearing this and, and you know, you were nodding your head saying that, you, you know, it almost looked as if you weren't surprised that the premature infants were showing these, these uh, responses so early. Right. Well, and I'm really excited about this um, work that Laurel is doing in France, because one of the things that we really need more information on is how the premature infants are responding neurologically and physiologically and behaviorally to the different elements of music. And we tend to kind of talk about music in this kind of big package, um, but it's made up of rhythm and tempo and timbre, um, mel melodic contour, all of those things that contribute to its complexity and this continuum of simplicity to complexity. And so for some of the things that I'm really interested in in my work is as we want to encourage families and other caregivers to use their voice and, and sound, um, in this environment, whether we're talking about premature infants or um, with full-term infants, right, to be using this as a, as a way to communicate with their babies and increase interaction and, and attunement. Um, we also want to unpack and really understand how and why what's happening in the music. And so that's really where I find myself focusing in terms of my research, because what I learned as a clinician is little tiny nuances in the tempo or my melodic contour, or even the attack of my voice, how precise I was in the pitch um, of my voice in the context of the environment mattered to those behaviors. And they were really subtle changes in that ability to read those behaviors. So we need more of that basic science to help us um, better understand so that as we're building interventions for infants and caregivers, we're actually targeting things that are safe and appropriate and can be replicated um, for, for wider audiences. Well, wow, that's, that's really surprising. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm trained as an opera singer, you know, and I, you know, and, and our founding advisor, Renee Fleming, you know, really speaks to the granularity of the kind of music that, you know, she performs. And so that doesn't su surprise me from the perspective of like stage performance, but the fact that it would have this influence, even at this early a stage, um, you know, is really interesting to, to contemplate it seems to me like there's a big um, push, at least in 
um, you know, the, the tech world to try to extract the parts of music that are most effective. You know, we've got these alg algorithms that will predict what's going to be a hit. You know, we've got, you know, all, all these kinds of, and in some ways, Live Lab is set up to do some of that work with all of these measures. Um, but sometimes I worry that, you know, we, it's just not going to be universally applicable and that like it's not a it's it, and that's you know it's it's not just like a one dose thing and that's actually the mistake I think a lot of music interventions make is just assuming um so I don't know if anyone wants to comment about that I mean I'm, yeah. <laughs> go ahead Laurel yeah I could comment on that because I think I think you know the one of the things about music is that it's communicative and as you say, there's so many different kinds of music and we don't want to listen to the same kind of music all the time, depending on our mood and so on. So, so what is really important as, um, as Deanna said, was looking at the cues that the infant is, is giving tells us a lot about, is this the right thing that, that we're doing? And so one of the things, you know, in a sort of more basic research context that I work in, that we're interested in is actually measuring communication and the, the subtleties of communication, nonverbal communication. And so one of the things that we've done is looked at analyzing uh, movements. So for example, in a string quartet, uh, the four musicians have to play together and they have to coordinate together without talking to each other. And, you know, they're going to slow down a bit, maybe at phrase endings, they're going to, you know, make crescendos they're going to have to articulate the same way there's a whole bunch of things that they have to coordinate um and so the other thing that we noticed what many people notice is musicians don't stay still when they're playing so there's for example swaying their bodies which they really don't need to do at all to play the notes so we wondered if those gestures were were communicative and sort of reflecting their thoughts about what's coming next and so by using some mathematical modeling, we were able to show that the way one musician moved affected how the other musician was gonna move next in time. So it was predictive. So it was, a, in a way, it, it, it's a measure of communication because the way one person is moving is gonna affect how the next person moves next. So we've now thought about sort of taking this idea of measuring communication um, into other contexts. So, uh, I had a student who was interested in speed dating, so we showed that, in fact, by looking at how the, the couples, um, you know, meeting for, for three minutes and talking, so how their body sway interactions, we could predict who's going to want to see each other again. So I would love to take this into young infants. We haven't done this yet, but I think it has promise as a measure to to evaluate like beyond the, the great intuitions of the music therapist to give us some kind of objective measure of, are you reaching the baby? So if the baby, if you do some, some gesture and the baby responds in some subtle movement that we can measure and we can show it's predictive, then we know we've reached the baby. We know the baby is there and picking up the information. And similarly, we can say how sensitive is the, the therapist or the, or the the caregiver, are they picking up those subtle, are they responding to those, those subtle cues? So I have some hope that we will be able to, in fact, devise measures that will be useful, I hope useful in the, the NICU. I, I mean, I, I, yeah, okay. sorry, Diana. <laughs> I was gonna say, I really love this because I think one of the things that we can learn as music therapists doing research in this context um, we could do more with things like mathematical modeling because access to large sample sizes is complicated and expensive and they're hard to measure. Um, and so things like mathematical modeling could be very helpful to us in understanding some of the predictive qualities of um, the work that we're doing, um, as well as not just the, the relationship of the music, but the nuancing of the therapist or the parent and responsive to the, to the infant. But I'd also like Helen to talk about her um, contingent singing model, because I think that is a clinical application of what Laurel was just talking about. And it's pretty amazing about those gestures and stuff. Yeah, yeah, that definitely comes. Uh, thanks, Deanna. Uh, the, 
the notions of communicative musicality, which were developed by Colin Trevathan and Stephen Malik, are uh, very much akin to what Laurel was just talking about. And certainly some of our uh, small scale research about that has demonstrated exactly that, that when we apply, systematically apply gesture and singing uh, um, facial expression in a therapeutic context, that we actually generate a, a predictable response in the infant. And, and part of that is, uh, as Deanna was saying, that nuance, right? So what happens when we slow the tempo deliberately? What happens when I change the timbre of my voice from speaking like this with good attack and change it to soften it and uh, make it, if you will, Laurel, a familiar term, loving tone? If I soften it off and make it like that, how does the infant respond if I lean in and open my face and go, and wait. And so we have that early information we have in small scale research, information about how infants do respond to those changes in, in us as caregivers, as parents, as therapists, etc. Um, and so how do we generate that into action going forward requires a village, right, ladies? It requires all of us with uh, the different features of uh, what we know and understand to uh, apply in this context. Well, Helen, I wanted to ask you a little bit to describe some of your work that you do helping, um, you know, find a voice from the care, mm -hmm. like helping the caregiver find their voice. Because I do right. think that, yeah, a lot of people are shy. I mean, even, you know, even, you know, when I, I'm an opera singer and I found it hard to sing lullabies to my kids without, you know, having some kind of, you know, thing about it, you know, was I doing it right? Was I being affected, yeah. et cetera. Um, so and I'm sure for people, yeah, who don't have a lot of musical training or any musical training, this can feel um, like some. And, and, and I think in our culture, we have this misconception that you'll just know how to do it. You know, it's the same misconception people have about, say, breastfeeding. Like, oh, it's just natural. Mm -hmm. You know, just it'll just happen for yeah. you. Like, don't worry about it'll it. It'll happen. Yeah, and it doesn't. And, you put, and, you, it, and then you... <laughs> No, and and I mean regular life is, is is complex enough. You know, when we did uh, we did uh, uh, there's a program that I've developed called Time Together, which is a one time session with parents, um, and we've done it both in the NICU and out in the community. I think I might be freezing a little bit, so I hope you're hearing what I'm saying. Um, and so uh, when we look at raising the, in a, a parent their own consciousness about their own musicality, all right. Uh, not teaching them how to use music, not training them in doing something. I, you know, I really have a problem with this notion that we're going to train parents in how to be musical or train parents in how to be parents. They are parents. They are musical. And I think our work is really about how to elicit their confidence in their capability to be musical. And this takes us very much into a sociological domain, right? So that we're really asking them to think about what kinds of sounds they're comfortable making. That might be singing, it might not. But you know, nursery rhymes are also patterned communication. Reading is a pattern of communication, right? Prayer is patterned communication. And so, helping the parent to find what aspect of their own expressive communication they're comfortable with. And if that song, great. If it's a lullaby, great. But what we're looking for is something that they can do over and over again. And the infant comes to recognise, oh, this is my mum loving me. This is my dad's song. I remember a situation where the nurses in the NICU many years ago came to me and said, Oh, this father comes off the night shift at the Ford factory every morning. He comes in at six o'clock in the morning and he sings the same song. He sings Neil Diamond, sweet Caroline. It's like, <laughs> can, you, can you please make him stop? I'm like, no, I will not make him stop. His baby recognised him through that song. They shared that moment together every morning at six o'clock. That is a gift, right? He felt entirely comfortable. This was his song that he shared with his son. And it was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So that, um, Deanna, makes me wonder too, you know, if, if it, you know, if, even the nurses in this like really beautiful example um, are somewhat hesitant to, uh, you know, accept the, this intervention. How do you handle people who you work with in the NICU where, you know, I can imagine there are situations in which, you know, the music therapists or, you know, are, are kind of, 
not respected or not, you know, that it's not, it's not shown to be a, a key part of the treatment, you know, especially in cases where lives are on the line, right? So can you tell us a little bit about how you navigate the relationship in the hospital setting? Um, Which is pretty complex. And I often will bring students into the NICU, not actually for the last couple of years due to the pandemic, um, but we're getting ready to, to go back in there and do some clinical training. And one of the things that we really work on is how are you gonna describe what you do to a nurse? How are you gonna describe your approach to a parent? And then having them practice thinking about, you know, gathering that information about the baby and what the baby's needs might be based on um, the development. I think some of the communication piece is um, helping whether they're professional or family caregivers understand how music therapy could be helpful to their babies when um, some of the, the misconceptions could be you should only be working with this baby who is almost full term because then they're ready for music and enrichment experiences. And so part of our um, educational process is um, helping them understand the role that music can have in sensory organization, um, helping with procedural support and, and helping the baby be less stressed. Um, but for me, the, the, the most pivotal aspect of, of, of getting access and, and being able to provide services is to build relationships. So, um, you know, I, one of my favorite stories is um, when I first started working in the NICU, um, and this was back in the, the 90s when there weren't a lot of music therapists working in the NICU and there was some skepticism and this one nurse was bound to determine that I should not be there. And so the way that we built a relationship was talking about her horses because she was really interested in horses. And so me kind of hanging out at the nurse station and engaging in conversation was actually what led her to become one of my biggest advocates because then, then she gave me the opportunity to do my work and she could see that and then we could talk about it. Um, but building those relationships and when you're approaching a family, being very careful and cautious about, is this the right time? And being able to read those nonverbal cues um, from families and, and introducing things slowly and not giving up when you get turned down the first time, but maybe leaving some information. Um, yeah. So some of my most powerful experiences of feeling like I've done a really good job have been with those families that were most hesitant to let me into the room. Um, and they've become some of the most important things. And oftentimes it starts with not having any relationship to music at all, but building that personal relationship. It sounds like um, the music therapy session next door to you is getting up on a full hear the drums. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And so just a reminder to our live viewers, uh, feel free to put some questions into the comments section um, and we'll get to those uh, in just a minute. You know, um, Laurel hearing, you know, hearing um, Deanna and, and Helen talk about, you know, underscores the, you know, the just the great therapeutic work that music therapists do that goes beyond um, you know, that has to be person specific or, or situation specific. Um, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about sort of, um, you know, the, this balance between the work that has to happen in a lab, which is kind of establishes some of these measures. And then, you know, what we need to think about as we go into the clinic where you can't necessarily replicate all the nice controlled conditions of the lab, but still, you know, get good data and, 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 you know, research out of, out of those environments? Yeah, well, it's certainly a challenge. I mean, I think my job is easier, <laughs> to be honest, uh, because we, we can, you know, control many things that just aren't possible in, in the, the real life situation. And of course, the other thing is a lot of the, the research that I do, we average across groups of infants. So we you know, have this group have this experience and this group have this other experience. And on average, we can say something about the differences and the outcome, but there's a big sort of caveat to all that. And that is when you're actually a clinician, you're dealing with an individual infant. You wanna know what's best for this particular infant. Um, I mean, I guess that's in a sense, it's part of this sort of general movement to individualized medicine that each one of us responds differently to drugs and interventions and so on. And I think 
that's one of our big challenges. Like we can say, we can do research that tells us sort of general outcomes and, you know, it's probably better to do this than, and, than that. Uh, but I think one of the things that, that Deanna and Helen have really emphasized is that every infant is different, every family is different, the interaction is going to be different. And so uh, getting to that level, um, I think, is where we really want to go. And now I think some of the, the sort of, when I was talking about some of these mathematical models where we can take, you know, multiple measures like movement of the infant, movement of the, the, the person interacting with them, uh, but also, you know, perhaps heart rate measures, uh, skin sweating measures. Um, so there are other physiological cues that I think we can also use that can give us individual information in the moment. So I think that's one of the things that may really help us uh, going forward to provide this sort of individual treatment is uh, to be able to measure these, these things in the moment, in an individual, and see, you know, be able to calculate sort of in real time, what is the reaction that I'm getting? You know, I could see sort of, you know, for some parents anyway, it might be reassuring to know sort of as I'm doing this, oh yeah, my infant's uh, heart rate is, you know, their heart rate variability is decreasing, which is a good sign. And so, you know, to have that feedback and then to know whether the, you're actually, uh, you know, making a positive uh, difference. You know, I'm hopeful that that's one of the directions we can go in. Yeah, and I imagine that, you know, in situations in the NICU in particular, there are a lot of measures that are being, that are right there already, like say heart rate as being an example, or even respiration rate. Um, and if we could train parents or, you know, I'm sure the music therapists are already being trained in this, um, to track these measures, and that could be another way to sort of look at what's, hap what's effective in the moment. Um, and that dovetails with a question that Eugenia has. Um, this, I think, is probably for any of you. Um, would you say that part of the positive results have to do with the fact that music interactions allow time and space for parents to become better observers of their child's communicative gestures? Um, you know, and, and, and that may need to measure this, the slowing down the attentional focus that music can bring um, as one of the mechanisms by which uh, it can have these positive effects. Maybe that's a question for Helen. Wouldn't you know it that this is when my uh, computer froze. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I could just say anything you like, but perhaps could you just tell me what the question was sorry, again, of course. please? I'm so sorry. Yeah, no. So the question is like whether some of the positive results of music really can be attributable to the fact that um, it allows for time and space for parents to be better observers of what's <sighs> happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the interesting thing is that, yeah, in music, we we because it does have a, a sort of a, a regularity to it, right? It has the phrases are roughly the same length when we sing, when we improvise a song and or when we sing a known song, they're, they're very predictable. And so it helps the parents in that space to both have time to observe their infant, but the infant to observe them as well. And so that regular, the regularity of a phrase and you get to the end of the phrase, and the, at the end of each phrase, there's an opportunity for them to observe each other. And actually, even in highly stressful situations, parents are actually usually better observers than they know themselves. And so, again, if we give them some opportunity to say, when you get to the end of the phrase, just watch what happens to his eyes, what happens to his face, you know, what, look at his eyebrows, the eyebrows are the window to the soul, you know, they tell you everything, particularly at the moment when everybody's like this, right? What's happening? What's happening to their eyebrows? Are they... Are they furrowing? Is your baby's eyebrows, are they doing this? Is he worried a little bit concerned about what you're doing? Is he a bit surprised or interested in what you're doing? Is he nice and relaxed and really loving what you're doing? And so we have this opportunity in song at the end of each phrase and during the phrases, but particularly at the end for the parents to take time. Yeah, um, Eugenia is really uh, quite right about that. Yeah. So Deanna, maybe you want to um, build on that and, and, and Karen B's question, which is, how can music therapists tell if preterm infants are overstimulated by music? Because music can also harm, right? There, there are times in which you know music doesn't is not always just a positive effects. So, uh, 
I, it's watching those behaviors really, really carefully. I mean, I think I was really fortunate in my early years of training that um, I was trained alongside nurses as they were being trained in the NIDCAP model, this neonatal individualized developmental care and assessment. So they were teaching me the things as they were learning them and they were standing by me and helping me identify these really subtle stress and self-regulatory behaviors. For as music therapists, it's really important to be able to watch the relationship between those monitors, what the heart rate and respiration rate and oxygen saturation levels are doing, but more importantly, to be looking at those behaviors and, and noticing is the baby, the, the eyebrows are a really big cue again, right? Those facial effects, um, you know, is it kind of a face open? Like, what is that? Or is it furrowed hands playing or kind of in general, anything that extends the body is a stress behavior. Anything that brings the body in in a relaxed way is a, is a self-regulatory response in general. So it's really important for music therapists that are working or anybody that's that is working in that context to be able to really read those very subtle behavioral cues. That's really interesting. I feel like that's great a great advice for parents of, of any or caregivers of any small children to know that I, I hadn't kind of thought about, you know, that, it, you know, those, those gestures. Um, Kimberly says that she or they find that many of um, their caregivers are unable to be at the bedside in the NICU um, a lot of the time for various reasons, especially if it's probably a long period. Um, so, and, and Laurel, as you've talked about, music can serve to bond. So I wondered if there, if any of you wanted to comment on this kind of fine line between the music therapist then bonding with an infant because in the absence of their primary caregivers, and like, you know, is that, is that always a good thing or can there be times where this gets a little bit murky if the parents come in and the child is now more bonded to a music therapist? Is that possible? Can, can I talk to that? Yeah. Um, I think that this is, this really comes to, to the notion that when we, uh, when music therapists work directly with infants, it sounds like it's just about the therapist and the infant, and it should always be about the infant in the context of the family, right? So the music therapists work with the families to understand the family's musical heritage, the music that is important to them, and the opportunities that are important to them. Music therapists should never be working with a baby without the full knowledge, permission, and being informed by the family. And so it's always about the music therapist working with the infant in the context of the family. And this will really uh, support the therapist as part of the approach for the, for the whole family, rather than just the therapist and the infant. Deanna, do you want to add something more to that? I think also there's some cultural aspects to this question is probably coming from someone in the U.S. where we have a system yeah. in place in our health care that, you know, we don't have paternity leave and maternity leave that allows parents to always be at the bedside. So in my clinical work, parents had to make that decision whether they take their maternity leave while the baby's in the hospital or if they wait until the baby comes home from the hospital. So sometimes I actually had my clinical hours in the evening so that I could be there when parents were around. So sometimes adjusting our schedules as providers can be helpful, but also having, um, you know, sometimes the, the parent would call to check in on their baby from work and the nurse would say, hey, the music therapist is here right now. And I would get on the phone and talk with the parent and talk to them about what was going I also left little notes, like just notes. Here's what happened today in our music therapy session. And this is what your baby did. And, and they would leave notes back to me and we'd, we'd, have, we'd find ways to communicate with each other that were um, empowering to the parents and the families, and, but also integrating them and, and providing the service that was, that was needed. Um, and then being careful. Some of these babies are on really strong restrictions. I never held a baby that was on restrictions for being held because that was saved for the parents. And so I think there's just a, you're interacting with these babies, but there's a different level of bonding between a parent and a baby than what you can provide as a caregiver that's not there um, every day or all day long either. And to some extent, you know, I think it's important for babies to feel as safe and attached to anyone in that early stage, and then they can switch their attachment um, later on as they come out of the hospital. Laurel, though, I wondered if you have done any research, um, you know, you've talked about the pro-social <laughs> impacts of synchrony and, and uh, you know, are there, should we worry about any of the antisocial ways that music might you know, effects that it might have, or, or is that like an understudied area or is it just not 
you know, there's not enough there, there. That's a very interesting question. I'm not sure I'm worried about that in the NICU, but um, sort of more broadly and as, as kids grow up and in, in adulthood, I think there is a kind of dark side potentially to music. So yes, music does, you know, when we experience music together with other people, we do bond with those people. But it also means that we're not bonding with people who are listening to different music than us. And so I know when my kids were teenagers, one of them was very into classical music and the other one played in a rock band. And, you know, at that age, they tend to, with, you know, socialize with their friends and listen to the same music, same types of music as their friends are listening to. So they, they were in very different social groups. So, so somehow, you know, being part of one group can often mean you're not part of another group. So it can be exclusive, exclusionary. Uh, so, I mean, that's, I think that's one thing we just have to think about. And, you know, it, it also, you know, goes back to the cultural issues and, you know, defining who you are is, is, is a good thing and knowing your, your heritage can be very powerful, but it can also separate you sometimes from another heritage. Um, you know, one other example is uh, in general, we think of bonding as positive, but, you know, if you're, uh, you know, if you think about, you know, say military groups who have music and use music to bond within the group, um, it also kind of gives them, a, makes it easier for them as a group than to go out and fight an enemy, right? So, so you're part of this group and you're not part of that group. I think that's part of what music is doing in those situations. So, so I think we do, you know, there's very little research on this that I know about, but I think it is something that, you know, we should, we should consider. I, I, I don't think it affects anything in the NICU, but, um, or probably early childhood, but as we grow up and we're figuring out who I am and who I'm not, music is part of that, that whole process as well. Yeah. Indra, could I just mention one last thing uh, the, sure. to say uh, that, that actually one of the other threats I think that we have is that in fact, um, uh, because we have personalized music listening now, so everybody listens to music through headphones, bad, you know, uh, earbuds, etc., that we have a loss of socialization in music, and that if there are any, if there's anybody working with pregnant women, um, to really encourage them to listen to music free field through speakers so that they can share that musical experience with their their, their baby who is not yet born uh, and to do the same when their baby's born so that, that that you do have a shared musical heritage that you're creating together so the loss of I think the loss of music as a social occasion uh, particularly for children who may not be you know accessing the same music through the same uh, streaming service you know etc you know we we want to really make sure we protect that experience uh for uh, unborn babies, newborn babies, and, and young children. That's yeah, my pitch. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really important and point, especially as we come out of a pandemic where, you yeah. know, if the problem was there 18 months ago, it's exacerbated today. Right. Um, yeah. And so I kind of wanted to just end with any of you, if you want to jump in with thoughts of how, have we learned anything from this pandemic that we can apply and change in, in the context in which you do your work? Um, you know, maybe Laurel for you, what kind of questions, you, you know, it brought up for you, um, you know, Deanna or Helen, you know, you weren't able to do your work uh, in the same way, you know, are there any, is there anything that you've learned that, that yeah, might aid your work moving forward? I think some of the benefits is this exploration of tele interventions, like being able to do interventions remotely. Most NICUs are in urban areas. And so this is going to give us opportunity to work with families that are living in rural areas. So I live in Kansas. The great majority of the state is rural. Um, and so one of the things that we're exploring here is how can we start to think about providing um, experiences for families and their babies outside of kind of this Eastern Kansas environment. So I think that's a benefit, um, but also it makes it really hard to do bedside work because you have to have all these protections in place. And, and the use of singing, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, we didn't know a lot about the aerosol. So we've learned a lot. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, just on those lines, I might add that in the research realm too, so we, you know, we weren't able to have infants and, and their families come into the lab during many parts of the pandemic. Uh, and we're still somewhat restricted. So we did go more to online again, uh, trying to do research online. And I've been amazed at how much we can do online. And one of the things is we've been able to do now is get parents to record themselves singing in their own home which we never would have tried to do before but you know when they come in and sing in our lab it's not the same as when they sing at home and so there's actually some value in having these these videos and they're much more like the real world than what we were getting before i think that for us it's really been um that because we haven't been able to get into the units, that the fo our focus has shifted to training clinicians. Yeah. So actually making use of online facilities to train a range of clinicians. I did a training uh, earlier in the year with people in Seattle and Cincinnati um, and Indianapolis. And, you know, we were able to come together on a regular basis and, and do that. Um, and because one of the issues that we have here is scalability of interventions and, sc and scalability of training to be effective in, in the unit once we get back in. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I will say that a lot, a lot of music therapists who are working in the NICU have remained in the NICU, uh, which has been a really interesting experience that they, with that, you know, you asked Diana before about the challenges in the NICU, but actually what we saw during the pandemic was that the music therapists were considered to be essential and they stayed in the, working in the unit. So that's really uh, exciting too. Well, that's a very optimistic note on which we can end. Um, so Laurel Trainer, Deanna hansen Abermite, and Helen Schumark, thank you so much for being on this webinar with us. So, and thank you to you, our viewers, for participating in this webinar. Um, our next webinar will be in January, when we'll talk about the role that music can play in incarceration. The Student Affinity Group continues to grow and is being led by doctoral students Clarissa Carlson and Rebecca Menza. If you're a student, uh, you can create a profile at the Sound Health Network's directory page uh, and, and then access that affinity group. And to learn more about the Sound Health Network and what we do to take advantage of our resources, including our clearinghouse of publications in this space, please visit our website, Sound Health ucsf.edu and you can engage with us through our social media accounts at Sound Health Net on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram and you can watch archived video content including our previous webinars on our YouTube channel. Thanks so much and see you soon.